Um, it's always uh, difficult to begin speaking to set up, for me, uh, to set up um, uh, a connection with you, a framing of my remarks, and particularly because I've been so discombobulated in this case by my experience in the last day and a bit. And there are two things that uh, I am trying to assimilate so that I can uh, be, um, to present more effectively to you. One is that I've spoken to several people about what uh, occurred this morning. And I have also before in Michigan spoken to actually quite a few of you. And I'm always running across people who know exactly what they're doing and are really good at it. And so I wonder, what can I add to that? You know, and I don't think it's worthwhile my coming here and just confirming what you're doing, making you feel good. There are an awful lot of competent people, as the city manager just said, uh, that I've seen, in fact, an unusually high proportion of competent people who are planners in this state. Um, and apparently what was presented this morning was nothing but evidence of that. The second thing is that I've just had a five and a half hour tour of Detroit, you know, from um, just before nine o'clock to just uh, half an hour ago, and it's absolutely eating my brain. <laughs> it's just blowing my mind. And uh, this is the fourth thorough tour I have had of Detroit. And I realize that the ability to manipulate the visitor is absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> uh, because the prior three tours were actually a, an exhibition, a display, a self-indulgence of the misery of Detroit. You know, just street after street after street of abandoned houses and, you know, uh, grassed over lots. Um, there was uh, visions from a distance of uh, quasi-abandoned buildings, you know, uh, as evidence of how great this city used to be. Incredible statistics, all negative, about, um, about um, the population you used to have, the wealth you used to have, the reputation you used to have. And, uh, and what happened to that. And I think that one of the probably most telling uh, things that I saw was about 1990-something, about 15 years ago, maybe 20, when we were preparing the, the, the master plan for downtown Birmingham, Michigan, about, essentially about 20 years ago. Um, I went up to Cranbrook and I saw a professor who gave me the first presentation of Detroit that I had ever seen. And he had mapped all the misery. It was actually a very large city full of black ink. This is miserable, this is gone, this is abandoned, etc. And I realized that there were actually some areas that were not black. They were actually, you know, they were not part of the ink, you know, of the things that had been inked away. And I said, how big are these good areas? How big are they? There seem to be 11, 12, 13, 14 areas that are good. And I said, how good are they? the areas that have survived. And they said, very good indeed. You know, excellent housing stock, good streets, mature trees, wonderful buildings downtown. So I said, OK, so the good is really good. And, and how big are they? And then we did scale comparisons. And I realized that actually any one of those areas is bigger than most of the good areas of famously good cities. You know, we just went up Woodward Avenue this morning, and it was just full of wonder and potential and, you know, just one incredible thing after another and people working like bees, renovating it, huge institutions. And it went on and on and on and on. I said, where does this end? We went all over to the GM building, right? And I said, how big is this? And he said, well, it's like, it's like Manhattan from the battery to the top of, uh, of, um, of uh, Central Park. I said, wow, that's huge. It's huge. And then I, something I always tell people, I said, you know, the cities that I know that have become very desirable are the cities that can put together three good blocks. You know, you put in three good blocks and you become a tourist destination in America these days. And Detroit has done that over and over and over again and with tremendous character. So I am now so, so excited about what I saw that it's very difficult to actually not just keep obsessing about it. But I want to perhaps put this in two, in two um, 
two, uh, plant two seeds that uh, you can take with you. Then I'll get on to things that are more relevant to your own towns and cities somewhere else in Michigan. But I want to plant this. Uh, one is, I also had a tour of Atlanta. Pretty similar in terms of what I was, they were trying to show me. And that, uh, you know, Atlanta's a famously successful place, as is Raleigh. This place blows the doors off the other places. I mean, there is, it's bigger and it's cooler than Atlanta and, um, and Raleigh. It's quite amazing. <laughs> now, this is not to say that Atlanta is not cool. It's just that this is actually more interesting here. Now, if Atlanta and Raleigh, which are great champions of success, of successful cities, of recent successes, have in fact less going for them than Detroit. And Detroit, which in my opinion is, boy, if I were young, I'd be in here moving right in here and starting my career here. You know, I'd, I'd have a hard time choosing between this and Sydney, Australia, which are fantastic cities on the make. If that's the case, if Detroit statistically is so miserable, are we looking at the right statistics? I mean, if we as planners, are we actually just looking at numbers and numbers and numbers? Because if you look at the numbers, yes, it's pretty dismal. But if you look at the reality of restaurants and markets and who's moving in and the quality of buildings and the condition of the streets and the trees and what's happening and the spirit of the place, you know, then Detroit's the absolute winner. So what is it that we're measuring? Like, what's happened to planning that we're just exclusively into metrics? Because if we're, we're just going to depend on numbers, if we're just going to be bean counters, we're going to lose what's really happening. And many of the successful cities are, in fact, uh, they have very, very good metrics. But the quality of life, the potential of Detroit is much greater. And I'm just asking this question, you know, how are we going to learn and transmit to the world that what's happening here is not conventionally measured, but you can feel it. You can just feel it. And um, I, 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 by the way, I didn't do the talking. Mark Nikita did, the, the, low, the so a 25-year uh, planner. He was driving and talking for five and a half hours. And I was the one exhausted. <laughs> I didn't realize that listening was so exhausting. But he has terrific energy, Mark, and, uh, and he knows exactly what's happening. He's like a cockroach. He knows exactly what's happening everywhere. I kept asking, how do you know what's happening inside that building, Mark? Like, how do you know what's happening? It's not evident from the outside. You know, and he knows. He's just completely, uh, his brain actually has been eaten by Detroit, uh, <laughs> which I'm trying to avoid. OK, so uh, now, by the way, after this, there's a, there's a seminar. Um, you know, for about an hour after I'm done, and I'd be much happier to uh, pursue whatever I say today that interests you the most. I don't know, I'm pitching a bunch of things. Now, it used to be that what I'm about to say was a revelation. And I think that uh, it's, uh, what's occurred to the planning profession is that they have actually really learned. They're no longer making mistakes. And I have a quote here from uh, Jane Jacobs that I don't think is any longer true. And it was like this. This pseudoscience of planning seems almost neurotic in its determination to imitate empiric failure and ignore empiric success. That was a famous statement. Why do we keep making mistakes? Why is it the fifth generation of planners, of professional planning in the United States, that keeps sort of falling off the cliff? I, I don't think that's, um, that's, that's any longer the case. I think that, that we have actually learned to appreciate and to do cities. So let's say that that has now, there's a new leaf. And it was actually this generation that tilted it. Now, uh, I think it's, you know, we all study success. We all study, uh, you know, oh, that city's so cool. Let's go see Portland. Let's go do this, look at that. I've always been the opposite because failure has soon loomed so large. And I didn't want to be the sixth generation of, of planning to fail. I've always studied failure. I am as interested in finding out why a place fails, especially if it's something I would have done. You know, when I hear a project of the kind that I would have done, a mixed use, diverse, you know, project, and, I, and, I, it's, and the, most, the more that it is like I would have done, the more I want to study why it failed. Now, if it's something I wouldn't have done, that's not particularly interesting. So I think it's very important to study failure. 
And I think it should be presented, and you should actually create an ethos here in which actually you can talk about things that went wrong, you know, the way that doctors do and the way that lawyers do. You know, this cannot actually, I would say that one of the problems with this profession, and it has to do with too much public engagement, is that we've become our personality is a feel-good personality. We have to make the citizens feel good, and everybody has to feel good, and we have to make each other feel good, and it's very hard to get a negative assessment. But I, I go for that, and I've learned a lot by doing this. So I want to drop that in. Now, there's also one other thing that I always say at the beginning, which is that there's a list of things that we cannot achieve as planners. They're absolutely beyond our, our uh, um, as they say, it's beyond our pay grade. And I think it should be very clear to people when you actually engage them what it is that we do not do and that we cannot do, that's in another realm, you know, economics, politics, et cetera. And the problem we have in the public process is that whenever, you know, which by that I mean when you listen to people and you take down notes, is that if somebody says something and you write it down, they think you've they've placed an order like at a restaurant. And you say, well, fix the schools. And you're like, oh, yeah, well, we'll just fix good old fix the schools, you know, or whatever, all this stuff. Like the electrical power should be, uh, should be wind generated. Yes, ma'am, would you like that with mustard and pickles, electrical power is wind generated. And people completely misunderstand, you know, this. And they think they've actually placed an order. And when you don't deliver, they feel betrayed. And it really hurts the planning profession. And one of the things I've always done, I, either, I have one of two modes. I don't write, you know, so they don't see me somehow taking it down. Or I say, we're actually not going to deliver that. And you know what happens when you actually say, no, we can't do that? The tenor of the audience changes. And actually, the grown-ups remain, and the kindergarten goes away. Because what happens if you're writing down the impossible, exactly the opposite happens. Suddenly, you say at the end, well, you know, all the good people didn't come to the hearing. That's the problem. Nobody comes to the hearing. We ran this right. Well, they don't come to the hearing because you've been treating everybody like kindergarten. Right? And so the kindergarten people come to the hearing, people that, you know, that actually have very little standing, you know, very little of the skill set and commitment that's necessary to convince the politicians. And actually, the really smart people you've turned off by being unrealistic. And I think particularly now, with how tough the 21st century is actually turning out to be, not just for Detroit, not just for Michigan, but for the nation, and perhaps for the world. It's a very difficult, austere century we're facing the more you are realistic with people, the more credibility you get. Now, your audience might get smaller and smaller, but also better and better. And that's who you want. Remember, you're not running a political campaign. You know, you say, oh, 200 people showed up. 200 people, that's not even good enough for a poll. Okay, so we're running stuff with this false idea that 200 people show up. It's not a political campaign. You're getting information and the information you want from the people most committed, most intelligent, most experienced. Don't turn off those in pursuit of five more, uh, basically, kindergarten folk that are going to show up. So it's very important to say what you can't do. And, uh, and you should sit down and actually say, what's the list? What's the list? What is it that really planners cannot do that we can't deliver? I have a list of four, but that's mine. I think you should personally have one. Think about it. Now, it's also important to understand and to explain to people, explain to people, I think, by the way, I used to have to speak to planners this way, but now I think people need to know. Uh, they don't understand why cities in America were driven down. They don't understand why they failed. And I think many, many Americans think that it's intrinsic. You know, the Tea Party thinks it's intrinsic, for example. Joel Kotkin thinks it's intrinsic to cities. Everybody says, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, there's something absolutely dreadfully wrong about city living, and it's only suburbia that really works. But actually, that's not the case, because uh, all of the Canadian cities, just to give a close-by example, are doing wonderfully well, and they never took a dive. And there are quite a few cities in America that are doing spectacularly well. And I think we all know that the young people love the cities. But you still need to explain what, what is it about cities what drove down the American city? Because it's not intrinsic to the city. So when you're restoring city living, you need to know that. Okay, so there's four things that I don't think people 
focus on. One is that the interstate system allowed people to go live in the suburbs and come in very easy to use the cultural assets. The great cultural assets of the cities, the opera, the churches, the theaters, the museums, which you lived close to, that amenity that you wanted to be close, suddenly became very easy to leave it and come back in and out very quickly. The second thing that happens, and this did not happen in Canada, the VA and FHA loans after the war were only for new construction. Just think about that. You had an old house in Detroit. It didn't have insulation. It hadn't been renovated since 1929. Didn't even have indoor plumbing. But you loved your neighborhood. And then they were giving these fantastic 30-year loans. But in order to actually accelerate the granting of the loans, they made some very simple standards. 50 foot by 100 foot lots, you know, 50 foot right of ways, all that. And if you do that, you if you meet the checklist, you qualify for these fantastic loans. But you did not qualify if you had an old, atypical situation. Because the government was not into, do, into checking things individually. So what's happened is even people who love their houses and love their streets had to make the rational decision to move to the suburbs. You know what a difference that made? Canada didn't have that policy. One of the reasons that the Canadian cities did not evacuate to the suburbs is that they gave loans for the renovation of existing neighborhoods. Huge difference. Now that, of course, has changed. But you have to tell people this. People left because it was the rational thing to do, not because there was crime. That came later. Things happened later. But right at the beginning, 1945, what made sense was Levittown. Because otherwise, by the way, why would you move to Levittown? Do you see the size of the trees out there? Did you see the eight-foot ceilings? Why would you leave these wonderful old neighborhoods unless it was simply impossible to renovate them? So that's important. The third thing is, okay, there was racism, redlining, blockbusting, okay, which did isolate the poor. We know that. That's actually true. That happened. Uh, the third thing is, remember this. Poverty is always with us. It was always with us. Poverty is in the best cities in the world. You know, London, Paris, New York, we've always had poverty. It's almost impossible to eradicate poverty. What harms cities is not poverty, okay? Somebody has to sweep the street. Just like a school needs a, a well-paid headmaster and it needs a staff of teachers, somebody ultimately actually picks up the trash and so forth. And they're not poor, but they're not living well. The problem is not poverty, it's concentrations of poverty. It's concentrations of poverty. If you actually, and before the car, actually you couldn't, you couldn't segregate people by class as much as you did. If you look at New Orleans, before they opened up the walls in the 1950s, you know, before they, they actually took the levees out and they could actually leave New Orleans, you could see that the poorer and the richer were highly integrated because they needed each other. They actually needed each other. And what happened was that the car actually permitted the segregation. You move away and you come here. It also permitted, by the way, the bypassing of the proximate merchant. Well, you know, there's a grocery store here, but there's a cheaper one there. Where there's a grocery store that's nearby, but that one has French bread. So you basically, proximity lost all of its, um, of its, its premium. You know, you didn't have to go to the closer of anything, because you could actually choose the one you like better. And so the geographic discipline of walking and of very short transit rides disappeared. And that's why the suburb actually became, became, came into place. You could actually live there and shop here. And the car did that. And that, of course, is entirely Henry Ford's fault. <laughs> Just to be clear about that. Um, the car should have remained an instrument of beauty and liberation and not a prosthetic device. The trouble with Henry Ford is he made it a prosthetic device. It's a place you could go to do absolutely rudimentary things. Have you noticed that in the ads, nobody ever shows a car doing something rudimentary? It's always actually in the landscape, going 80 miles an hour, beautiful California landscapes, or sort of wheeling in to some, some a cobblestone plaza. Has anybody actually ever been shown with a grocery bag or sort of dumping kids somewhere? No, because that's a prosthetic device. You don't want that. But that's what happened to the car. The car has actually got, it's really lost a huge amount of its glamour. It's something we need, and I think that has really downgraded the automobile. But that's another, another story. Um, oh, I just had to say that in Detroit. Uh, okay, now, um, now there are additional reasons uh, as to why cities, cities were, were driven down. 
One is that, again, this is huge. The planners of the 1960s attempted to compete with the suburbs by suburbanizing the cities. Okay? If you say, well, the suburbs have an advantage because they have more parking, let's demolish stuff downtown to have more parking. Or the shopping malls seem to be doing really well, let's just uh, pedestrianize streets. Remember, once you're competing head to head with something that was designed to be that way, you will always be second best. The city never has enough or good enough parking. Okay, you'll never be as good as a suburban shopping mall. It's always suddenly second and third rate. So you cannot compete with the suburbs at what the suburbs do. You compete with the, against the suburbs with what you do well, which is actually the vitality of the street life. Let me just make just a very, a very clear thing. The suburbs have a lousy front. When you step out of the front, it's boring. You can't even walk. What you have is a backyard. Okay, it's all about the yard. In the city, you do not have a yard. So why would you live in the city since you don't have a yard? And by yard, I mean a series of things, right? The only reason you live in a city is the vitality of the street life. So the, what, the, what the suburbs do is out the back door. What the cities do is out the front door. Now, if you do a city that doesn't have street life, so it neither has a backyard nor a front door street activity, why would you live in the city? So it's absolutely crucial, crucial, central, absolutely central, that you actually have the, the vitality of pedestrian life in the front. Because if not, it does not make any sense at all. Because actually, the unit itself, the private realm in the city, is almost inevitably inferior to the McMansion. You can't beat the McMansion at what the McMansion does, so don't compete at that. What you compete is with the, with, with the street, the destination, the quality of the walk, and that's what makes cities. And there's an awful lot of high density without urbanism, what I call townhouses without towns, you know, that always fail. So it's about the front, the front door. Um, now, this was built in. When you try, as we very often do, to build downtown, we're actually fighting the codes. The codes of most American downtowns are actually suburban. They envision the suburbanization of the city. You know, and because it only comes up, because the problem only comes up one building at a time, and by that rare person that actually wants to build an urban building in an urban setting, you know, the new urbanists always do. You realize that the code, you not only are, you have to fight the code to do the right thing. Because people, even in New Orleans, it was just amazing after the hurricane when we came in and started working in New Orleans, the parts that New Orleans lo uh, loved uh, were illegal. You know, because somebody had glommed on, had clamped on suburban co uh, zoning standards. And not just zoning, but sometimes uh, building standards as well. Okay. It's very important to comb through your codes and comb out the impediments. It, they will not jump out at you. The impediments do not jump out. You can read your code. You can take it home and read it and say, oh, this makes sense. This is nicely written. It all makes a great deal of sense. It's health and safety and this and that. Lots of green. What's the problem? You only find out what's wrong with your code when you actually try to build an urban building. And then suddenly the list comes up, and that's where you need all the variances. Okay, so, you know, one of the things this generation has to do before it goes, uh, before it retires in Leisureville in Florida, is you've got to clean out the codes that you or the prior generation put in. You've got to deliver to the next generation of planners codes that are really urban. Where you want it to be urban, that should be allowed. You shouldn't have to fight that. And uh, it's, a, it's a specialty to do that because you have to think from the point of view of the developer, think from the point of view of the architect, not from the point of view of the lawyer because the attorney is always looking at clarity and sort of equity and that kind of thing. You have to say you have to look at it physically. And that's why form-based codes make sense, because form-based codes actually force you to envision the form of the city. So is this the city form you want? And once we agree what the city form is, you can code it. If you're having difficulty writing a code, if you've ever had difficulty, it's not a problem with the English language, I assure you. The English language can do anything. It's a problem that you haven't got a clear enough vision of where you want to be. 
So you know, it's not about how do I describe the parking. Decide where you want the parking, what kind of parking you want, what kind of facade you want, what kind of anything you want, what kind of stoop. And once you decide what it is that this genetic material, which is a code, you want to engender. Once you decide clearly, it's really easy to write a code. Okay? It's, not, it's not a difficult problem. Now, something I've alluded to but is really interesting. In the old days, and I think we all, we're all steeped in the old days, it's amazing how much uh, planners love to talk about you know, St. Louis and Chicago competing with each other, or what Portland and Seattle was like, you know, that kind of stuff. The old Atlanta, you know, Hossmann's Washington, it's all very good. But there's one thing that happened that's very clear. Up until relatively recently, maybe 50, 60 years ago, the cities competed with each other. St. Louis against Chicago, you know, et cetera. And we're still focused on that. Boy, are we losing things to, are we losing things to Tennessee again? You know, what's up here? You know, why are the cars going there? We're thinking in terms of, of city competing with city. And that's not the case. That's a state level problem. And it has to do with policy, nothing to do with planning. Okay, just, you know, when the car, when the car businesses go to Alabama, like they're all going to right now, forget about it. You know, that's economic policy. What you need to focus on is that rather than competing against another city, every city is competing against its own suburb. Okay, that's the new reality. You gotta completely wrench around and say, what does it feel like if I'm moving into, say, let's say a city, an imaginary city somewhere. If I'm moving here, the city that I'm in charge of as a planner or as a city manager, and I wanna build an office building, what's the choice? Because the person coming in, okay, you've collared the building. The, the, the business is coming. They're going to want to build an office building. So what's the choice? They can either go to the suburb, to a suburban pre-permitted office park, follow some very simple rules that the master developer has pre-negotiated, right? It's pre-negotiated. And there's even some aesthetic rules that make it predictable. You know, you're going to be, you're going to be a glassy chrome, you know, chrome mullion office building with a couple of mounds in front, and the other guy's going to do the same thing, and then, the, you know, the path is going to, you know, the bike path is going to come together. And by the way, just follow the drawings, and if you've ever permitted one of these as an architect, you know it takes two hours, and that includes having coffee with the master developer, okay? That's what happens in the suburbs. That's the actual experience for a developer in the suburb building in a, mass, in a, in a, in a pre permitted master plan community because the difficulty of getting the big permit has already been done by the master developer. Okay, remember that. Now, you come to a city and you say, well, well, we get the mayor to welcome you. Yes, we really love your company. We want you to move downtown. And then they say, call me when you need help. And so the first thing is, and by the way, it's very helpful if you would hire any one of these six lawyers, or perhaps all six, okay? And by the way, don't, don't anger any neighbors, okay? You know, I, you know, we'll help you have a public process, and then, of course, my planning department has an uncoordinated uh, presentation of, te of technique because, you know, the fire code doesn't actually coordinate with the setback code, doesn't actually, and then you've got lead, you know, lead standard that somebody said is a prerequisite without actually voting on it. You have to be a complete nutcase to live in the city. Completely crazy. It makes absolutely no sense to develop in the city. And the same thing goes if you're going to open a store. So you want to open a store. Well, you go to the shopping mall and say, sir, what's the size? What's the rental? Do you have security? Yes. I, I have a cookie store. Are there going to be any other cookie stores? No. In fact, we'll put you next to the bookstore because actually cookies and books when you wait for movies, make sense. Everything is coordinated. You know you're going to be basically your big investment in a business is going to be protected. You know what happens in a city? <laughs> Absolutely on your own. You know, what's the landlord? What's going to happen? How big is it? Am I going to be charged for the last 50 foot of depth that I can't even use? You know, is there going to be a tobacco store next door ruining my cookie smell? Like, what the hell? You know? So, of course, it's insane to open a store downtown, which is why only young people do it, <laughs> okay? Because they, they they're totally risk oblivious. And, uh, and what about a house? What about a house? Well, you know, I love city living. I know all about city living. I spent two years in Europe. I know what you're talking about. But is your investment safe? Well, when you go to a street in Detroit or a, seat, a street in St. Louis and you see the house you fall in love with, this house, this beautiful house, and it's only $250,000, 
And then you look down the street, and there's an empty lot. And then beyond an empty lot is a kind of three-story dingbat with columns, you know, on stilts with parking underneath. It's completely incompatible. And you say, sir, excuse me, but is that allowed? Oh, yes, well, that's, what, that's allowed by the code. So basically, the house you love is completely unsafe as an investment because you look around, and it's actually a free-for-all. Who's going to live in a street that can actually allow that and allow that? And I'm not even talking about police department response. I'm talking about hostile neighbors, you know, visually hostile neighbors, a complete free-for-all. And this is my investment. I'm supposed to invest in here. Well, let me tell you, I hate those, those cheap cardboard uh, uh, McMansions out there. But at least I know that next to me is going to be another McMansion and another McMansion because there's going to be a private homeowners association that actually gets everybody to mow the lawn and so forth. So all these people that would love to buy these bargain buildings downtown, well beyond or well before it becomes a kind of a security problem, it becomes a, an investment problem because the codes don't work, because the downtowns are a free-for-all, because you don't have any real master plans in which a developer can actually say, by the way, you may, there may be nothing here, but I can tell you that this is what it's going to be like and that's where the shops are going to go, and that's where this is going to go, right? And the city can never do that because it doesn't have master plans, not real master plans. They have you come in and we'll decide, you know, which is very scary. Now, out in the suburbs, listen to what happens. You have to buy a house. What are you confronted with? You're confronted with mud and bulldozers. Is that not less secure, less predictable? Not at all, because the suburban developers know very well that they have to be able to say, this is where the shopping center goes, this is where the pond goes, this is where the townhouses go, this is what the houses next to you look like. So out of, with very little to go on, the developers, because the, the suburban developers, because they have real master plans, can actually have people trust them that their investment will be safe. And in a city that's 80% built, already with, you know where the church is going to be, you know where there's going to be, 80% is built, and the city cannot tell the buyer what's going to happen on that street. And by the way, the evidence is that the city doesn't know what's going to happen on the street because everything's up for negotiation. All of which is to say that the cities are at a tremendous disadvantage to the suburban developers in their own suburbs. And we really have to focus on this. Okay, you really have to focus, not of the city. Don't look at your city from the inside. Huge mistake. You're looking at your city from the inside. Look at the city from the outside. Completely turn around and say, if I were to move into this city to start a business, to open a shop, to buy a house, and I have the downtown and I have the suburbs, what does it feel like? And you will see, I know very few American cities that actually equalize that choice. And I think many, many Americans love, would love to, particularly the young and some of the retired people, and 30% of Americans would love city living, but they cannot make the rational choice to live in the city. The, the rational choice is the suburb. And that is entirely, remember the list I made about things that we can't affect? You know, I'm sorry, I, I, can't, I can't do a, a regional economic planning, I can't take care of climate change, all that stuff. We can't do that, but we can we can level the playing field. And there's a solid 30 to 60% of Americans that prefer urban living, and they simply can't do it. 100% our job. OK, so there are, there's a lot more to talk about, but let me just do it very quickly, OK? The first thing is focus on what an amenity is. What's an amenity? Every suburban developer knows what an amenity is. An amenity is what you get in addition to what you buy. It's I get my house, I get my square feet, but I also get a golf course. Or I also get a pool house. Or I also get security because I got a gate. Or I am one hour from a ski lift. Okay, that's the amenity. It's what you buy plus what you get. What is the amenity in the city? The amenity in the city is urbanism, okay? It doesn't make any sense to just sell square feet because as soon as you say, yeah, I got the light, I got the window, I got the bathroom, everything works, the switches work, what else do I get? 
If you don't deliver urban life and everything that means, then you don't have an amenity and you can't compete. So that's number one. Every suburban developer knows what the amenity is. It's what you get in addition to what you buy. And by the way, they provide it because their public realm is a private realm. They control the, pro the public realm. You know, they build the amenity. That's entirely up to the city. You know, the private developer developing a private lot in Detroit, you know, they cannot provide the public amenity. It has to be the collective of the planning and zoning department that actually delivers the urbanism. And then you can say, yes, this is your old apartment, nice, pretty good light, plumbing not too bad, but look at the street life. And then you can sell it. So that's number one, okay? And I think you pretty know how to, how to deliver that urbanism. I think the planning uh, profession has actually learned to do that. Okay, what's the second thing that needs to be incorporated? Civic decorum. Um, civic decorum, let me just uh, actually um, present it in terms of crime, okay, which is actually a big deal here in Detroit. It's not enough to not have crime. You have to have the perception of not having crime, okay? And the problem is that we Americans are incredibly sensitized. We're hardwired now to actually identify a place that's unsafe. You know, when I see a yellow light, so-called crime light, that's associated with a place that's unsafe. When I see graffiti, that's associated with a place that's unsafe. When I see a broken window, that's associated. When I see chain link fence, God forbid if you see razor wire, if you see a lack of maintenance, you know, we just know that. It's part of our genetic, of our cultural material now. There are certain restaurants, well, that's not, we're not, we're not gonna park here. So, but now you can actually have a guarantee from the mayor, it's absolutely safe to walk at night every hour. Okay, you still have to deliver what uh, I think Clem, uh, um, uh, Greenberg, the city of Charleston says, a place has to be comfortable. Okay, it just, you cannot statistically have a crime-free city. People have to be comfortable. Now, yes, we've become a bunch of wimps. You know, if you look at a photograph of Detroit in 1940 or 1930, or any city in America in 1940, 1930, you see a bunch of panhandlers, you see a bunch of people not very well dressed, you see all sorts of horrible looking trash on the street, but we used to be tougher. The problem is that the suburban developers have escalated that level of perfection, the level of utopia, you know, that that's now the new standard. It's really bad news. But if you say, hey, it's good enough, we haven't got a crime, but you know, I have seen suburban developers, big deal guys, you know, with big watches and Jaguars, see a piece of paper on a lawn. I'm not making this up, in California, I'm being driven around by a big deal developer in uh, Orange County, and suddenly he stops the car, gets out, goes out and picks up a piece of paper. The boss picks up a piece of paper from the lawn, and he puts it away. And he knows that actually that piece of paper would be reason for perhaps a buyer not buying a house there that day. Because people are looking for that standard. So it's really unfortunate, but we're up against something very odd, which is a very fragile kind of cultural situation that's scared, literally scared away by even the perception. Now I want to say that that's passing, that actually the kids that are coming up seem to enjoy it. But the middle class, the, the sort of the, the middle class, the middle-aged middle class is very sensitized to that. And you really do have to go, do a good job. And uh, you can't do a good job citywide. You have to select axes, places. I think Detroit is already doing that. You have to select places that actually are performing impeccably from a municipal point of view, in which there is no crime. There is no bad light bulb. There is no tree untrimmed. There is no sidewalk falling apart. There is no graffiti. You know, don't do it for the whole city because you'll dilute your, your efforts, but certainly you have to actually begin and begin. I think Detroit is instinctively doing that, actually. It's actually improving itself. That's, so that's the second thing, which is called, what did I call it? I called it the civic decorum. The third one is the market response. This is super important. Let's see if I can wind back to something. Every revitalization of a decayed place, and I've gone as far back as the left bank of Paris in, in 1870. The left bank of Paris was a slum. 
and it was pioneered by artists and writers. And they made it cool, sitting in the cafe, you've seen the paintings by Degas, these sort of slightly degenerate students, you know, smoking probably opium cigarettes, but definitely cool. They made it cool. They always pioneer. It's, what, it's who pioneered Soho, it's who pioneered Key West, it's who pioneered Miami Beach, it's they're the people who are pioneering every place that has actually go, gone down and been revitalized has been pioneered by a group called the Risk Oblivious. And they involve young people, artists, and gays. And it's the combination of having a good eye, you know, a good eye, and not much money. So they say, I can't afford anything, but this place looks good. They make it cool. You know, they open the cafes, they open the cool thing, they, they, they make the old Italian surviving grocery store seem cool instead of some loser thing. Then who follows? Who follows are the risk aware. And these are the first developers who come in and say, hey, this place is cool. Okay. Oh, by the way, the original people of the Risk Oblivious, they don't ask permission, they don't get permits. They move in, thank you very much. You know, they're underneath the radar of the city. They move in, the city leaves them alone. The second generation is called the Risk Aware. And they're developers who say, aha, this place is cool. There's enough of an upside in the, in the value that I can actually get a mortgage. Right? And once I can get a mortgage, I can afford to pay an architect, I can afford to get permits, I can afford to go through the process. In fact, I need all those papers to be able to sell this properly so they can get a mortgage and get insurance. And so that's the risk aware. And they're the developers. Now, unfortunately, if I may just go aside, what always happens is you get uh, the risk adverse, which in New York are the dentists from New Jersey. And once they move in, everybody has to go out. And believe me, I'm not making this up. It's happened everywhere. I am devastated at what's happened to Miami Beach. You know, it was so cool, and it's so uncool now. And it's uncool because people like me went to buy an apartment, I have to say. I drove all the gays out single-handedly. <laughs> so, you know, what a drag. But I moved in because you guys were so cool. Won't you stay? No. You know, you're not cool enough. Let's not worry about that, and that's absolutely inevitable. There's absolutely no way to prevent that from happening. But let's get on to a real phenomenon. Have you noticed that this continent was built, inhabited, until very recently, without public-private partnerships? Just think about that. Why did the public-private par partnership emerge? It's less than 20 years old. Before, people could do it on their own. The reason is, that city municipal bureaucracy exterminated the activities of the risk oblivious. You can no longer move in. You can no longer inhabit without permits, without permission. Everything is code, 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 code. Oh, you would like to make a cookie? Well, you need a grease trap. Ah, you'd like to sell a sandwich? Excuse me, but does that sandwich have cheese? Oh, so you'll have a freezer for the cheese. Well, don't you need an electrical transformer that costs $70,000? You know, and so it goes. And by the way, you see that upstairs? Oh, 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 you're gonna make a commercial on the first floor? But sir, it's been commercial for 80 years. Yes, but now the fire exit doesn't work. And what about, and what about that little step? What, what are you gonna do about the handicapped access? What about that? And what about the handicapped bathroom? Well, excuse me, sir, I only have 400 square feet and that will eat up 180. Oh, well, forget it. What's happened is that the nanny state has written so many codes in the last 30 years, just piling them on, piling and piling and piling and sprinklering and transformers and grease traps and exhaust vents and, and triple glazing and lead and on and on and on and on, that they have completely, government has completely exterminated that first market, the risk oblivious, that used to pioneer. And so the city has had to, has to, had to step in to give huge loans to developers because the differential between what the city is cost causing the developers to spend cannot be amortized by a market that is not yet there. You see, what happens is the developers will work when somebody else has made the upside of investment this big because cool people have moved in and made this that if you prevent the cool people from moving in and you want the developers to spend all that money, they'll say, where's the profit? 
because the place isn't yet cool. So I said, don't worry, I'll give you tons of money. And we have to wind it back. We have to wind back the bureaucracy. Among the reasons we have to wind this back is not just that we haven't got the money. Have you noticed that we haven't got the money? What the real estate bubble actually revealed is not that there was a real estate bubble. That's actually going to blow away. We're, we're past the real estate bubble. The problem is that it revealed a absolutely comprehensive underlying impoverishment of the public coffers at every level, national, state, local, infrastructure. We haven't got any money. The whole idea of public-private partnership has no future. Now you can stagger on a little further, okay, but that has no future. And by the way, the present has nothing to do with planning. It's all about the future. Get set up for the fact that there ain't going to be any money. And so what you need to do is forget the dinosaurs, the big projects, the, the very few big developers that can actually, because there's another thing, okay, what I meant to say about this is not only do we have no money, we have exterminated the small developer. Because once you touch government, so much as touch government, and the government offers to help, you need to be a big deal. Because it takes a very long time, and it's lawyering up and down. It's all lawyered up. It's all professionalized up. You know, everything has to be submitted, big reports and so forth. We have exterminated not only the risk oblivious artists and their ability to pioneer, we've exterminated the small developer because you cannot amortize government help for a six unit building. It has to be a big guy. So instead of having a, I go to city after city that used to have 100, 200 developers and now they have three the choice of three. How many people applied to your project for that waterfront? Three. But weren't there 200 that built this city? Yeah, they're now carpenters and contractors for the three developers. What happened to them? Why are there only three? Because we've exterminated the many. And among the many are the young. Okay, there are 80 million millennials. 80 million. A, they can't get jobs in corporations. It's absolutely unabsorbable. Okay, but they have an incredible amount of energy. Okay, they're just like we were. For God's sake, they're between 20 and 30 years old, complete with confidence. Actually better educated than we were, much more confident than we were, even more confident than we were, and they want to act. Now, in 1970, when I was their age, in 1970, 1980, I did amazing things, absolutely. I mean, I designed Seaside when I was 30. I was doing high rises when I was 26. It was possible, you know, Remember the famous building in Miami with the window in Miami Vice? We did that. You know, when we were 26, 27, it was amazing. Young people could do things. We've exterminated that possibility. And we being the bureaucracy that we have built. And we need to wind it back because the young people can't act. They've done two things. First of all, remember, the young people graduating did not grow up with bureaucracy. They didn't grow up with regulations this big, okay? Remember, you know how difficult it is for people my age to know computers, really know computers? I didn't grow up with them. We, people of, of, of my age and pe most of the people in this room, grew up with bureaucracy. So we know how to navigate it. It happens slowly. You know, the temperature on the pot got raised, so the frog never had to jump out. But we have to realize that if we had now entered this field at age 24, we would be totally overwhelmed. They don't know how to navigate this at all. And so what they do is they opt out. They can't do it. And they can't do things what, let us say, the pioneering that I mentioned. So why have they discovered Detroit? Why is Detroit the absolute coolest city on earth now? For exactly the same reason that Prague was the coolest city on earth in 1990, and they were all there, and why Berlin was the coolest city on earth in the year 2000, and why New Orleans is the coolest city on earth in the year 2010. Because what's happened is the dysfunction of government has permitted the young to act. Okay? And what I want to say now is that the world is, the world is vibrating with excitement for Detroit. You know, and it's not the big, the wonderful big things that are happening here, it's the word is out. The young people everywhere. You mentioned Detroit. It's funny because you mentioned Detroit to the 60-year-olds and they roll their eyes and go into conniptions. 
you know, it's incredibly sort of horrible that it responds, oh, Detroit, and one of the great failures of American everything. You mentioned Detroit to a 20 to 25 year old, and they say, yeah, man, cool. Do you know what happened? Do you know what that is? That actually government stepped back and allowed them to act. That's really what happened. So the lesson of Detroit, which is an unbelievable, unstoppable success. Nothing's gonna stop it. What I saw today, nothing is gonna stop it. This place is gonna get cooler and cooler and cooler and cooler. And it has to do with the fact that when a government inspector shows up, some kid is doing something, the government inspector doesn't say, can you give me 16 pages of this and legal? They said, don't hurt yourself, kids. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. In some measure, lesser or greater, depending on your degree of desperation, that is what you need to do in the next 10 years. The 21st century has finally started. It didn't start in the year 2000, it started in 2008. The first eight years of this century were just the tail end of this grotesque wealth that we've had for about 100 years. It's gone, it's evaporated. Now we see the outlines of the future, it's perfectly clear. Okay, we can see it. Remember, planners are not about the present. You're staggering on. But we're all going bankrupt, date certain. Date certain, virtually every city in America is gonna lose it. But you can avoid it, because you have 80 million people with tremendous energy. And by the way, if you think this is difficult, let me just remind you of something. Detroit, the Detroit that's in front of you, this magnificent city, was built when there was nothing here but mud and mosquitoes. Okay? And they built everything. They built the streets from nothing, they built the sewage from nothing, the electrical from nothing, everything from nothing. So even if you have a city that you think, oh, what little prospects do I have in my little Michigan city? You have a street grid. You have functioning utilities. You have a police department, however inadequate it may be. You're so far ahead than the pioneers that began and built your city in the first place. You're so far ahead, it's unimaginable. So why isn't it happening? Because you're preventing it from happening. Because it's very valuable land. All the cities with all their infrastructure is very valuable already. It's only that the 80 million can't act. You know, you've reduced the number of actors to a tiny, tiny point that can negotiate with government, you know, either help or simple bureaucracy. It isn't going to work. We can, you know, we put up with it, but we haven't got the money to do it anymore. So, to end, let's see if I have any more notes here. Um, there's something that I call, uh, I call municipal tailoring, but there's a better word called subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is a theory of government that, that, that that actually posits that the decision is made that the appropriate level for decision making is the most local by the smallest group at the latest time that can competently make it, okay? So what happens is there may be decisions, let's say parking policy, or let's say whether to have chickens. You're gonna allow chickens. You're gonna allow chickens. Well, shall we have a municipal discussion on chickens? Let's just take four years, and then the condo people come in and say no chickens, and they win. Well, chickens are ultra cool, okay? The decision of the chicken is not made at the level of the city. The decision on the chicken is made at the level of the block, okay? It's, not, it's also not made at the level of the, of the house, because you know that one house can have a rooster or smell and bug the neighbors. So the house is not the right level, neither is the city, but the block is. You can actually run a decision on parking, you can run a decision on mixed use, you can run a decision on outbuildings, you know whether you're gonna allow outbuildings in the back, that actually form no end to the pain of being an elected official. I know the right thing is to allow outbuildings because you know the older people now need uh, um, income supplement, there are a million students that would like to live there. You know, my, the, the, parent, the, the folk are getting older, that could be a caregiver. You know, all these decisions where we want outbuildings. So let's have a citywide decision on outbuildings. The answer is always no, 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 no. It's amazingly often that the planner has to conclude 
secretly over drinks, democracy doesn't work. It's just one decision after another. Yeah, this was the right thing to do. No. Those are, yeah, democracy doesn't work. I mean, public process doesn't work. Like, there's this kind of pull that is on the planning profession about the number of times, the unacceptably high percentage in which the decision is palpably the wrong one. And the reason is the absence of subsidiarity. We're asking people to make decisions at the wrong level. I'll never forget, when we were working in the master plan of, uh, of uh, Birmingham, Michigan, there was a, a bike path that was gonna run something like 13 miles. It went from yay to yay, right? Huge bike path. And I remember, to my astonishment, that six or three or God knows how many people in Birmingham blocked it. They clipped it because there was a time, you know, these nice houses, there was a point at which that bike path, you know, which followed a river or something like that, actually were in people's backyards and they didn't want that violated. So I said, how is it possible that six people can block a bike path? Well, because you're asking people at the wrong level. It's not that democracy doesn't work. It's you're, you're not running a democracy. You're running a mob. What you did is you invited the, the people within 100 feet or 1,000 feet, all of which are specialized. It's not a democracy. What democracy demands is a random sample. And you've invited all the people most affected. That's why nobody wants a school. Oh, well, let's invite the people within 3,000 feet to see whether they want a school. The answer is no because it's the traffic. The level for the decision of locating a school is at the level of the city or at the level of the neighborhood. We will never get a power grid that works connecting our solar, our solar, uh, our solar uh, uh, farms and our wind farms to where we actually need them if we have to ask all the neighbors whether they want a new power line easement. Because you don't ask the neighbors. That's at the level of the state. The state decides where the easements go. The block decides where the chickens go, right? The neighborhood decides where the schools go. You know, the block face decides whether you're gonna allow any color paint. And the planning profession has actually committed to public input in a completely rudimentary level. Like, well, let's just invite the people to come in. And let's make sure there are enough black people and white people and Hispanic people which, by the way, we're pretty good at. What we're not good at is, have you ever asked the young people for whom it actually, we're actually working? Because it takes about 20 years for a plan to have effect. Those 20-year-olds, they're 40. Why don't we bring them? Well, we never, never remember to bring them in. Beyond that, beyond that, beyond that, the public process either has to be thrown out completely, and people have to make decisions based on professional principles, which is the bike path goes through. Right? And no chickens in condominiums. You can do that with confidence. <laughs> or, or you can actually have a, run a public process that is based on subsidiarity. And this subsidiarity, the transect, which is a new urbanist proposition that says, that actually says in what context is this happening? Is it rural? Is it urban? And the idea that you actually know what generation you're working with. You know, you don't, you don't always posit the climax condition. You actually begin at a certain level with younger people, and then eventually you become, you get the real developers in. These are tools that we're developing. And these tools are called, it's called the Lean Initiative. It's called the Lean Urbanism Initiative. And what's happened to the Congress for the New Urbanism is that we've realized that as we've become a kind of magnificent beast, you know, in which people pick up the telephone in Washington. We can talk to the APA. We can, t we can invite the president of the APA to show up. We can actually, we have a seat at the board at LEED. You know, that kind of thing. We're sort of a big deal now. We've become a kind of 20th century dinosaur. And the young people have invented something called tactical urbanism, you know, in which they go out and they don't deal with bureaucracy. They just paint that, you know, they need a crosswalk, they paint it. If they want a park, they buy some sod and install it. They do chair bombing. They say, oh, we want a cafe. We want to be able to encroach on this street that obviously no one's using. So they rent a bunch of chairs and, 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 and umbrellas and they do chair bombing. These are tactical, very, very light, 
very, very um, demonstration projects, not permanent. These people who are doing tactical stuff are of the age and ability that they could do the real thing. The emergence of tactical urbanism is an aberrant creation of the fact that we don't let our under 30s to do anything because the bureaucracy has prevented it from acting. And so this whole lean urbanism initiative is to do something in between tactical urbanism, these incredibly energetic, clever young people that can't do anything permanent, and then what's happened to the Congress for the New Urbanism that has become a kind of big deal player, and there's something in between which is absolutely where the 20th century has to go. You know, it's called lean, lean urbanism. And guess where the first meeting's gonna be? By the way, it's a closed meeting because we don't have our act together, okay? But it's gonna be in Detroit. And we could have chosen any city to do it, but this is the city that's pioneering it. This is the most interesting thing that's happening in planning right now, is the city of Detroit. And uh, so uh, see what you can learn from it. I certainly have. Thank you.